ever seen a movie? All of us? Okay, good. Good. So we can all be on the same page here. Uh, I'm, I'm going to fill you in on a little Hollywood secret. I've got a lot of experience in uh, movie making. But movies and books and TV shows and all these stories that are told through different, in different ways are actually all plagiarizing one story. And it's the story of the gospel. Now think about, think about your, you know, some of your favorite movies, some of your favorite books that you've read. There's a, a general pattern to the way the story goes. And they're all slightly different. They all, you know, the, the thing now is you've got to put a spin on it. You know, nobody ever saw that coming. But the, the general format of, of these movies and TV shows and things like that are all the same. Essentially, you start off with life's great, right? Everything's good. Everybody's happy. And then something happens, something difficult, something bad. A, a, an antagonist shows up in some way. There's something wrong, all right? If you're watching a, an action movie, it's a bad guy that's going to come and start killing people. If you're watching a romantic comedy, you know, something happens that messes up the, the cute, perfect relationship. But something happens. And at that point... Plans begin to be put into place to fix whatever is broken, whatever is wrong, whatever happened, a plan is put into place to fix that problem. And usually there's some sort of hero or some person that is tasked with this job. Okay, this is going to be the person. They're going to fix this, right? And so throughout the movie, that's the biggest part of the movie. You know, typically you go watch a movie, it's only, you know, everything's great for the first like five minutes and then something happens, Maybe 10 minutes, depending on if it's a kid's movie. But something happens, and then this person or this group of people are introduced onto the scene. They're going to come, and they're going to fix this problem. And say so they go through this process throughout the whole movie. And just right at the end, when it seems like they're going to be victorious, everything's going to be great, all hope is lost. Something happens. The hero dies, or they're seemingly defeated and you, you wonder, is this the end? But you know it's not because you've seen movies before. And all of a sudden the hero comes back. They bust through the door and they be defeat the bad guy and everybody lives happily ever after. That's, that's kind of the story. You can kind of sum up every movie you've ever seen in, in some form or fashion in that way, right? That's kind of how things go. Go home today and watch The Lion King, right? Everything's good. I just can't wait to be king. And dad dies, and you got to go into hiding. And you got to come back, because everything's terrible, and you got to come back and save the day. And just when it seems like you're there to save the day, it looks like the enemy's going to win until he triumphantly pushes him into the fire, and everything's great, and they all live happily ever after. That's the story, right? So many movies, so many books, so many TV shows follow this. And the reason why is because it resonates with people. And the reason it resonates with people is because it's the story of the gospel. It's the story of God rescuing his people. For further evidence, watch some of your favorite movies and notice at, in that near the end when the hero seems like they're defeated. Notice how many times that hero looks like this. It's not by accident. Go watch The Matrix. I like movies, by the way. Go watch The Matrix. When he dies, his arms are like this. Go watch The Hunger Games. When she dies, her arms are like this. Go watch Superman. When Superman dies, after he was stabbed in the side, by the way. That's, a, that's another one there. But yeah, there's a reason why. It's because the story of the gospel resonates with people, even people who who don't know Jesus as Savior, that story just rings true in our hearts because, that's, because God created us for this relationship. And that's the story of Scripture. Last week we talked about the fact that mankind, every person that walks this earth, was created in the image of God to live out God's purpose that he created us for, to live in a relationship with him, not just for a little time, but for eternity that's how the story started. It was good. Everybody's happy. Life is good. But then the issue comes along. The enemy shows up. 
and tempts Adam and Eve and they eat the fruit and now you've got conflict. Now the relationship is broken and the story could have ended there, right? I mean, let's be honest. Put yourself in God's shoes. You create everything. You do all of this. You create people. Everything's perfect and then they turn around in like five minutes and mess it all up. Wouldn't you be tempted as God to just be like, I'm done. <laughs> you guys had your chance, but I'm not going through all this pain. But that's not what happened. That's not the end of the story. That's the beauty of it. They sinned. Sin came into the world. God's design was broken by sinful people. But that is not the end of the story. The good news is, the story goes on, and the good news is the gospel. He began a rescue plan, and oftentimes we look at the birth of Jesus as the beginning of that rescue mission. But there's a whole lot of other parts of the movie, so to speak, that happen before that occurs. And what we find out when we look in Genesis is that the rescue mission didn't start when Jesus was born. The rescue mission started right after Adam and Eve sinned. God already had a plan. He, he knew what he was doing. And here's what we see. Uh, you don't need to turn there. We're going to be focusing on some different passages today. But in Genesis 3, verses 14 and 15, this is after the fall. Adam and Eve have sinned. And this is what God says specifically to Satan. He said, verse 14, the Lord God said to the serpent, because you've done this, because you've tempted Adam and Eve and, and they sinned, because you've done this, cursed are you above all livestock and above all beasts of the field. On your belly you shall go and dust you shall eat all the days of your life. I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and her offspring. He shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. All right, so this, this seems subtle, right? Sometimes we focus on this and we look at it and we're like, well, I wonder if snakes had legs before this. Who cares? Instead, look at what he says in verse 15. I will put enmity between you and the woman and between her offspring, your offspring and her offspring. He shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. This is the first prophecy of the Messiah, the first prop prophecy of the Savior, the first prophecy of Jesus Christ. It's not the first time we see him in Scripture because he was there at creation, but it's the first time we see something that says Jesus is going to be victorious. He's going to win. He's going to be the one to end all of this. And we know that because of verse 15. It says, in, in this translation I'm reading the ESV, it says bruised twice. He uh, you, he shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. That's actually two different words. What it more literally means is you will strike his heel. You will cause him pain and suffering, but he will inflict the killing blow. He will crush your head is literally what that word means. And so this picture starts to come up here of a plan coming into place. The rescuer is coming. The the offspring of the woman, who is Jesus, will be the one to ultimately crush the head of the enemy. That's going to happen. Now, of course, the story goes on and on and on, and we go through the generations, and things happen, and people sin, and exiles, and all of these things go on, and ultimately, Jesus is born, and he walks this earth, and the, the rescuer is there. He's going to come, and everything's going to be great, and then he dies on the cross. And there's that moment where the hero seems like they're going to be victorious and all hope is lost. But then Jesus arose. That's the gospel. That's the story. That's the reason this type of story resonates with people. But what we're looking at today is the fact that this story didn't start because mankind, because me and because you and because everybody else said, let's go find our way back to God. Let's fix this. Let's do whatever we can do to fix it. This story started when God said, let's go get them. And God began pursuing his people who had been lost. People tried to, over the years, have tried to, to make a way to God. It's never turned out well. 
Tower of Babel was, was probably the first uh, incident that we see where people said, hey, let's... Now, I don't think they were trying to get to God. I think they were trying to be God, but over and over throughout the centuries, people have tried to make the way to God, but the reality is God made the way. He's the one who said, let's go get them, not let's sit around and hope they find their way back. He made a way. The creator is pursuing the creation. And so today we're going to look at two stories that illustrate this, that God's pursuit of mankind, and this first story is great, by the way. We're going to look at Hosea, if you want to turn in your Bible there. We're going to look at Hosea, and this is a great story to use because you may wonder sometimes why preachers use a lot of illustrations. God loved to use illustrations. Jesus did too, and he walked around, and you know, he would see things, and he would use those as illustrations. The kingdom of heaven is like. You've heard him say that. Hosea is a great illustration where God orchestrates something very unusual, something you would not expect to be the picture of his faithfulness in the face of his people's unfaithfulness. That's what's going on. The, the kingdom is split at this point. You've got the northern kingdom of Israel and the southern kingdom of Judah. And Israel has gone astray. They were, by the way, at the tail end of a very profitable and peaceful season. Life is good for Israel, but as it often happens, this prosperity and this peace leads to spiritual decline, you know, essentially, even though nobody would ever say it, but it happens in this country too, we wouldn't say it, but when, we're, when we've got food on the table, we've got money in the bank, we've got gas in the car, and we're healthy, we don't need God. We think we don't need God. And so we begin to act like we don't need God. And we go and we make our own plans. Well, that's what Israel did. Life was good. They had money. They had crops. Things were going well. So they strayed away from God because they thought they didn't need him. And God was going to bring them back. Even though they had been unfaithful. And he used this illustration with Hosea. A very real illustration, by the way. Not a <laughs> He really told Hosea to go do this so that it would be an illustration to his people. So we're going to read verses 1 through 9. Typically, typically I read in the ESV, and I try to stick to one translation because I don't want it to ever seem like I'm picking and choosing which translation because it fits my point better. I don't like to do that. Um, but I am going to use the NIV and read this just to make it a little more family-friendly. Um, the ESV has some words that you may have to explain on the way home. So we will use the NIV to read these nine verses of first nine verses of Hosea. So again, Hosea, the prophet of the northern kingdom of Israel, the last prophet before they go into exile in Assyria. Here's what the word says. The word of the Lord that came to Hosea, son of Beeri, during the reigns of Uzziah, Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah, kings of Judah, and, the, and during the reign of Jeroboam, son of Jehoash, king of Israel. When the Lord began to speak through Hosea, the Lord said to him, Go, take to yourself an adulterous wife and children of unfaithfulness, because the land is guilty of the vilest adultery in departing from the Lord. So he married Gomer, daughter of Diblaim, and she conceived and bore him a son. Then the Lord said to Hosea, Call him Jezreel, because I will soon punish the house of Jehu, for the massacre at Jezreel, and I will put an end to the kingdom of Israel. In that day, I will break Israel's bow in the valley of Jezreel. Gomer conceived again and gave birth to a daughter. Then the Lord said to Hosea, call her Lo Ruhama, for I will no longer show love to the house of Israel that I should at all forgive them. Yet I will show love to the house of Judah and I will save them, not by bow, sword, or battle, or by horses or horsemen, but by the Lord their God. After she had weaned Lo Ruhama, Gomer had another son. Then the Lord said, Call him Lo Ami, for you are not my people, and I am not your God. So let's talk about what's going on here. First of all, we need to understand God called out Abraham many years before. He called out Abraham. Abraham is going to be the father of a new nation and is going to be God's chosen people. These, these will be God's people. And through him, God said, through you, Abraham, I'm going to bless the whole world. 
And that is through Jesus. Through Abraham's line, Jesus would come and he would be the blessing for the whole world. So we need to understand that first. We need to understand that when God called out Israel, when, when he pulled them out of Egypt, like we studied in Exodus, we pulled them out of Egypt and he made a covenant with them and, and gave them the law, there was a reason for all that. And, and a big part of the reason was that they were supposed to be a picture to the rest of the world or what it looks like to live in a covenant relationship with the creator. This is what life should be. This is how you should live. This is the standard of God the creator. They were called to be a light to the nations that surrounded them. Sometimes we look at Israel and we're like, yeah, they're you know, supposed to wall it off because God said, don't go marry people from these other places. You know, wall it off. Don't let anybody in. Don't let anybody out. That's not what it was. God said, I want you to be a light to all these places around you. And the reason he told them not to go marry people from all these different places is because he knew that they would bring all their false gods and all their false religions back to Israel, which is exactly what they did. But they were supposed to be not a, a seclusive society that never spread out from their walls, but a people who loved and cared for people and lived in the world in the way that God wanted them to live so that people would see his chosen people and say, I want to be part of that. P.S., that's exactly how the church is supposed to live. Not locked up in our four walls, but out in the world, living a, a set-apart life so that people look and say, I want to be part of that. I want some of that. So that's, that's who Israel was, to be a light to the world surrounding them, to be a picture of what it looks like to live in a covenant relationship with the Creator. But just like Adam and Eve sinned and went astray, Israel sinned and went astray, and they broke that covenant. They were unfaithful to that covenant with God. And so God's response here with Hosea is to give this illustration, this real-life illustration and so he says, Hosea, go marry an adulterous woman. Sounds interesting, right? Now, we don't know for sure if Gomer was previously adulterous or if, if what God is saying here is go marry a woman who will prove to be unfaithful. We're not sure, but it doesn't really matter. Essentially, Hosea is told to go marry this woman who is or will be an adulterer. And have children with this woman as a picture of God's relationship with Israel. God made a covenant. Marriage is a covenant, right? It is an agreement, an eternal agreement between two people, or a lifelong agreement between two people on this earth to, to live and, and be married together, as come together as one flesh. God says what, what God has brought together, let no man attempt to separate. So, this covenant relationship in marriage is the same as God's covenant with Israel. He made a covenant with them. He kept up his side of the bargain, but Israel was unfaithful. They were adulterous in their relationship. They went after other gods. And so God wanted this relationship between Hosea and Gomer to depict his relationship with Israel who had been unfaithful. And so it's showing God's faithfulness in the midst of his people's unfaithfulness. That's the picture here. God is faithful even when his people are not faithful. And it all uh, comes together in, in, in chapter 2. Turn over to chapter 2, starting in verse 14. This is God's plan. Okay, he's got this wife, Israel, who has been unfaithful to their covenant, to their marriage. And this is what God said he's going to do. Ver starting in verse 14, chapter 2. Therefore... Behold, I will allure her and bring her into the wilderness and speak tenderly to her. And there I will give her her vineyards and make the valley of Achor a door of hope. And there she shall answer as in the days of her youth, as at the time when she came out of the land of Egypt. And in that day, declares the Lord, you will call me my husband, and no longer will you call me my Baal. For I will remove the names of the Baals from her mouth, and they shall be remembered by name no more. And I will make for them a covenant on that day with the beasts of the field, the birds of the heavens, and the creeping things on the ground. 
And I will abolish the bow, the sword, and war from the land, and I will make you lie down in safety. And I will betroth you to me forever. I will betroth you to me in righteousness and in justice, in steadfast love and in mercy. I will betroth you to me in faithfulness, and you shall know the Lord. And in that day I will answer, declares the Lord, I will answer the heavens and they shall answer the earth. And the earth shall answer the grain, the wine, and the oil. And they shall answer Jezreel. And I will sow, for, sow her for myself in the land. And I will have mercy on no mercy. And I will say to not my people, you are my people. And he shall say, you are my God. So God's people are unfaithful. Just like Gomer is unfaithful to Hosea. And God says, I'm going after her. I'm going to allure her. I'm going to speak tenderly to her. I'm going to call her out and bring her back so that she will say, you are my husband once again. God's people have been repeatedly unfaithful, but he's coming after them. He says, I'm going to turn this barren land into a vineyard of hope. Notice in that passage the role of God. This is a, a good Bible study tool. Go through in your Bible sometimes and uh, mark what the role of God or the role of the Father or the role of Jesus, the role of the Holy Spirit. What are they doing in this? Look what God is doing in this or going to do. Verse 14, he says, I will allure her and speak tenderly to her. Verse 15, I will give her vineyards. I will remove the names of the idols in verse 17. I will make a covenant, verse 18, a new covenant. I will make you lie down in safety. He says, I will betroth you forever in righteousness. Verse 19, in justice. Verse 20, in faithfulness. By the way, he's, he uses the word betrothed here. Notice he's not, uh, he's not saying, I will reconcile the, the marriage that exists, but we're going to start over. A new marriage under a new covenant under the blood of Jesus. All right, you broke the old covenant, even though I didn't, but I'm going to bring a new covenant and make a new relationship. So it's this betrothal, not patching up the old, but making something new, returning like to, to courtship almost with his people. It says in verse 21, I will answer. Verse 23, I will have mercy. That's what God is doing. All of those things God is doing. And notice what her role is, what Israel's role is. To answer, verse 15, she will answer as in the days of her youth. And verse 16, to call him her husband. That's it. Not to try really hard to be good. Not to try really hard to keep the covenant this time around. But to answer, to respond in faith. Even though she was continually unfaithful, God is pursuing her. And through his grace and through his mercy, he's going to betroth her to him in righteousness and faithfulness and justice he is he is the one going after his wife his bride his people this is the picture that we have in in hosea look finally to chapter 3 verses 1 and 2 at some point gomer left we don't we don't know the circumstances but you know, she was there, she had three kids with, with Hosea, and then at some point she's gone. And here's what God tells Hosea to do. The Lord said to me, go again, love a woman who is loved by another man and is an adulteress, even as the Lord loves the children of Israel, though they turn to other gods and love cakes of raisins. So I bought her for 15 shekels of silver and a homer and a lecta of barley. By the way, uh, even though it's not my thing, cakes of raisins are okay. Uh, that is associated with some of the pagan worship that went on at the time. But what's happening here is Gomer, the wife of Hosea, has left, has broken the covenant, and is now with someone else in an adulterous relationship. And God says, go again. Go, go get her. And what does he do? He goes and he buys her back. That is literally the definition of redemption. To literally go and pay the price. 
to buy something back. Something that was already yours, you're going to go and you're going to buy it back. And that's what Hosea does. That's the gospel message. God's people went astray and he came and he bought us back through the blood of his son Jesus. That's the gospel. God is pursuing his people who are just over and over and over continue to be unfaithful. And what does he do? He sends his son and he buys us back through the sacrifice of Jesus. He is in pursuit. He is making a way. The second story we're going to look at briefly today is the story of the prodigal son. Luke chapter 15, if you want to turn there. Now in this story, there, there's so many different uh, applications in this story. There's so many different messages that could be preached from this story. Uh, so I know that we're not going to hit on everything in just a few minutes here. But what we're looking at today is the younger son. Now there's a whole other set of circumstances going on with the older son who stays with his father. But we're going to look at the younger son today. This younger son who represents sinful man. So we're going to read Luke chapter 15, verses 11 through 24. And he, Jesus, said, There was a man who had two sons. And the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of property that is coming to me. And he divided his property between them. Not many days later, the younger son gathered all that he had and took a journey into a far country. And there he squandered his property in reckless living. And when he had spent everything, a severe famine arose in that country. And he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to one of the citizens of that country, who sent him into his fields to feed pigs. And he was longing to be fed with the pods that the pigs ate. And no one gave him anything. But when he came to himself, he said, How many of my father's hired servants have more than enough bread, but I perish here with hunger? I will arise and go to my father, and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me as one of your hired servants. And he arose and came to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and felt compassion and ran and embraced him and kissed him. And the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, bring quickly the best robe and put it on him and put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet and bring the fattened calf and kill it and let us eat and celebrate. For this, my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found and they began to celebrate. What do we see in this passage? Well, the father, first of all, represents God. He is the one you know, and, and notice what he does. He gives his son, both of them, the freedom, the free will to choose their path. He doesn't stop him from taking his, his inheritance and going off and spending it wildly. And the son that we're looking at today, the younger son, represents sinful man. He's taking this inheritance and he goes away and he squanders it, Scripture says, on reckless living, useless things. And when money ran out, famine arose, the son was hungry, and it says he came to his senses and he decided, I'm, I, I need to go back home. I got to go back. Maybe there, at least, my father will hire me as one of his servants and I'll at least have food to eat and a place to sleep. So the son says, I will arise and go to my father. Now, at first glance, we may look at that and say, well, it's not the father pursuing the son, it's the son pursuing the father. That's not actually what's happening here. Yes, the son is pursuing the father, but he's pursuing the father because the father pursued him first. The father may not be out searching the countryside to find him, but he has left the door open for his son to return and is clearly awaiting his return because when he's a long way off, what does, what does dad do? He's gone. He's down the road. He's running to get him. That's what he's been waiting for. We see in this passage the, 
the role of the Father who invites us and welcomes us, opens the door for us, but doesn't force us to come in. And so the Son chooses to come back and he's welcomed back by his father notice what what happens there you know have you ever you you've been going you have a a conversation coming up whether it's at work or family or something and you know you know how you go through the conversation a thousand times in your head right I'm going to say this and then they're probably going to say this so then I'm going to say that and you know you go through all the different scenarios well what if they say this and then I'll say that and we'll do that and rarely does the conversation go exactly as you planned it So the son, it seems like, is going through this in his head. All right, I'm going to go to my father. I'm going to say, I've sinned against heaven. I sinned against you. I don't deserve to be your son anymore. Uh, Can I just be one of your hired servants? Will Will you hire me to work for you? But notice, before he gets through his whole speech, dad's already planning the party. Look at, look at that again. Verse 21, and and the son said to him, Father, I've sinned against heaven and before you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Conversation over. Go get the robe. Go go kill the fatted calf. Go get a ring. My son is home. There's no question whether his son is coming back as a servant or a slave or anything else. He's his son. That's what God the Father does. We see the grace and the forgiveness of the father, welcoming his son home with open arms, bringing him in, not as a slave, not as an employee, but as his son, as his heir, even though he already took his inheritance and squandered it. You're still my son. You're still the heir. Next week, we'll, we'll get into this a little bit more. Next week, we're talking about adoption. God adopting us into his family when we come to faith in him. He makes us his children. What a beautiful thing. This is the nature of God. He's pursuing us just like we saw in Hosea. He's pursuing his people. And when his people in return run to him, he opens up his arms and welcomes them as his children. The son went from being dead to being alive, from being lost to being found. And it all started with our first point for today. It all started with the father pursuing him. From the time sin entered the world in the garden, God began pursuing mankind to bring them back into a relationship with him. All of the stuff we see in the Old Testament is setting the stage for the rescuer to come. All of the stuff we see from Abraham and and the nation of Israel, from Moses and the law and the tabernacle and later the temple and God dwelling with his people, from the judges rescuing the people and teaching them, bringing them back to being faithful, from the kings and the prophets, all of these things, God was working on his people and working on his rescue plan. And all of it was pointing to the fact that there's no earthly king and there's no prophet and there's no priest and there's no law and there's nothing else on this planet that's going to save you that's what God was telling his people throughout all that stop trying to go to all these other things look to me salvation is not going to be accomplished by man it's going to be accomplished by God who relentlessly pursues his people and he continues to do that that's the beautiful thing He's continuing to do it. It wasn't just then, it's right now, right in this moment, sitting in this room, watching on your computer at home, and all the other churches around here and around the world, God is still pursuing his people. Jesus, when he was on this earth, you know, he's here for about 33 years. He lived a life without sin and perfect union with the Father. He died a sinner's death to pay the penalty for all mankind as God pursued the lost. But when Jesus was nearing the end of his life and he he was talking with his disciples and he actually told them, it'll be better off, it will be better off for you if I go so that the Holy Spirit can come. And it's kind of a mind-boggling thing because I think most of us would choose, if given the opportunity, we would choose to hang out with Jesus in person sitting right next to us. That would be pretty awesome. But Jesus says it would be better off 
if I go so that the Holy Spirit would come. And one of the reasons is because John 16, 8 through 11, Jesus says, when he, the Holy Spirit, when he comes, he will convict the world concerning, of, concerning sin and righteousness and judgment, concerning sin because they do not believe in me, concerning righteousness because I go to the Father and you will see me no longer, concerning judgment because the ruler of this world is judged. Now clearly here Jesus is talking about those who are not saved. The Holy Spirit is going to convict the world because they don't believe in me, is essentially what he says. The Holy Spirit is working even right now to convict the world and say, you're a sinner. You need Jesus. That's what, that's what the Holy Spirit is doing and that is how God is pursuing his people. He's pursuing his people through his creation says in, in Scripture that he's put glimpses of himself in his creation so people look and, and know his invisible qualities, Scripture says, he's put into creation. And what it all boils down to, I believe, is Acts chapter 17. The Holy Spirit's inside convicting, creation is outside singing the praises of God. We look at it and we see it, and what does man do? Acts 17 26 and 27, it says, And he made from one man every nation of mankind to live, on, live all the face of the earth, having determined allotted periods and the boundaries of their dwelling place. Verse 27, That they should seek God and perhaps feel their way toward him and find him. Yet he is actually not far from each one of us. That word feel, the, the literal translation is to grope. I know you probably don't like that word, but that's what that means. The picture is, is of a sinful man, blinded by sin, but having seen glimpses of God in his creation and having felt the conviction of the Holy Spirit, stumbling around in the dark, feeling for something because he knows he's there. And, and Paul says he's not far from any one of us. And so as we feel around in the dark, we find that God is right there waiting with open arms for us. This story of the prodigal son shows this beautiful picture of God allowing us to go our own way, but always being willing to welcome us back home. He's not going to force people back home, but he is going to receive them when they run to him. I mean, we, we can't save ourselves. I, if anything else is clear in Scripture, that's clear. We can't save ourselves but we do have a responsibility in salvation to respond in faith to God. Just like Hosea, God says, I'm going to allure her, I'm going to pursue her, I'm going to call her out, and I'm going to speak tenderly to her, and I'm going to do all, this, all these things, and what is she going to do? She's going to answer, as in the days of her youth. She's going to call me her husband. That's it. She's not going to save herself, but she is going to respond to God pursuing her. Romans 10, 13 says, everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. And so God is pursuing us relentlessly and we have this responsibility to just call on his name in faith. This is what it says. Romans 10, we're going to read 9 through 13. It says, because if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. I mean, we can stop right there, but we'll keep going. For with the heart one believes and is justified, and with the mouth one confesses and is saved. For the scripture says, everyone who believes in him will not be put to shame. For there is no distinction between Jew and Greek. For the same Lord is Lord of all, bestowing his riches on all who call on him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Everyone who believes, everyone who calls on his name, everyone who runs to him, he will be there with open arms. He is pursuing us. And secondly, we are the pursued. We see this in, in Hosea, this beautiful picture of a husband going after his adulterous wife and redeeming her at great cost to buy her back. He remains faithful. He sacrifices for the sake of his bride to bring her back, even though she has not been faithful over and over again. People, we are that bride. We are that adulterous wife who has gone astray. Now, I know Hosea is about the nation of Israel, and, and uh, most of us, I think, are not 
of the line of Abraham were not Israelites. But notice again what he said, what God said in there. I'm going to make a new covenant. And that new covenant is in the blood of Jesus. This is what it says, Galatians 3, 7 through 9. It says, Know then that it is those of faith who are the sons of Abraham. And the scripture, foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith, preached the gospel beforehand to Abraham, saying, In you shall all the nations be blessed. So then, listen to this, so then those who are of faith are blessed, along with Abraham, the man of faith. It is those of faith who are sons of Abraham. So when God says, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to bring my wife back, he's talking about us. Those of faith, those who put their faith in Jesus and are saved, we become children of Abraham. Now that does not take anything at all away from God's chosen people, Israel. He has made promises to them that don't apply to everybody, and that's okay. But that does mean when we put our faith in Jesus, we become that wife who was bought back. We become children of Abraham. Now, understanding that, I want to read this again, and we're almost done. I want to read back in Hosea. Chapter 2, verses 16 through 20. I want to read it again with that in mind. Put yourself in the shoes of the one who is going to be redeemed. Put yourself, when he says, when he says, I will betroth you to me, put yourself in those shoes and listen to these words. In that day, declares the Lord, you will call me my husband and no longer will you call me my Baal. For I will remove the names of the Baals from her mouth, and they shall be remembered by name no more. And I will make for them a covenant on that day with the beasts of the field and the birds of the heavens and the creeping things on the ground, and I will abolish the bow, the sword, and war from the land, and I will make you lie down in safety, and I will betroth you to me forever." I will betroth you to me in righteousness and in justice, in steadfast love and in mercy. I will betroth you to me in faithfulness, and you shall know the Lord. That's for us. He came to rescue us. We are that bride, and we will be with him forever. This is ultimately a picture of the coming kingdom, but it can begin right now with a relationship with Jesus. God is pursuing, we are the pursued, and finally, we have a role in the pursuit. We have a job in this pursuit, and we're not going to look at it very much today because the last three weeks of this series are going to be all 2 Corinthians chapter 5. We are ambassadors of Christ. We're going to look at that in detail the final three weeks of this series but I couldn't get through this without mentioning that as God pursues mankind, as God is going out after people who have been unfaithful to him, for some reason, in his infinite and endless wisdom, he said, I'm going to use these people to accomplish that mission. I'm going to use my church to go and tell people about salvation in Jesus. We have a role in this pursuit. We have a job to do. We are ambassadors. We are agents of the pursuit, telling the good news of salvation in Jesus to the world. If you've been redeemed, if you're one of those people that says, I have been bought back, I have, I have trusted in Christ, I have run to the Father and given my life to Him, then you've got a job to do, and I've got a job to do, to go tell people, about salvation. We have a mission to go and make disciples of all nations. So the question for us is who, who needs to hear it? Who's in our life that needs to hear it? Who's out there right now that you say that person needs to know about salvation in Jesus? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask you right now to, I'm going to go old school here. I'm going to ask you to close your eyes and ask you to bow your heads. And here's what we're going to do. We're going to close out our, our message today. I want to call you to respond to this in one of two ways. One, if, if you are a follower of Jesus, 
If you're a born-again follower of Jesus, I want you to take a few moments and pray for God to put somebody on your heart that, they, that needs to hear the gospel from you. I want you to pray that God will put that person on your heart in such a way that you can't sleep until you go tell them about Jesus. Pray for that person. Ask God to reveal whoever that is to you, or maybe you already know right when I said that you knew of somebody. I want you to pray for that person and pray for that opportunity to share with them the gospel of hope. Secondly, though, if you're not a follower of Jesus, I want to invite you right now while while everybody's eyes are closed, nobody's looking around, just to quietly stand up and walk to the back, and there will be some gentlemen back there who would love to talk to you and tell you about a relationship with Jesus. They would love nothing more than to pray with you and tell you how you can have a relationship with him. That's what it's all about. God has been pursuing you, and maybe right now the Holy Spirit is is just ringing loud and clear in your heart saying, you need this. And if he is, I just beg you, don't cling to the back of that pew in front of you and say, "Uh, that feeling will go away, or I'll wait till next time. Do it today. Go. I want to invite you. We're going to sing one more song, but before we we do, I'm going to give you uh, just a 30 seconds to a minute of of, of silence and give you a chance to pray. And I, during that time, while everybody's eyes are closed, I want to give you a chance to walk to the back and talk to somebody about a relationship with Jesus. So take this time to pray and make decisions that you need to make.